Okay, welcome to the uh, December 2nd uh, meeting of the Community Preservation Committee, our last meeting of the, of the year. Uh, and as someone said, Linda just said, uh, goodbye 2020 and welcome 2021. Uh, Julia said that, I guess. Uh, doesn't look like, Sarah, that we're joined by anyone else other than whose faces nope. I am seeing. So we will not have any general public comment, nor do we have any minutes to approve. Is that correct? Not this yeah. time, no. Not this time, no minutes. So moving right on to a very brief uh, chair's report. Uh, and just to reiterate the finances that we have, uh, we have funded 468,006, or recommended for funding, $468,600 for the seven projects. Five of those projects we'll be reviewing tonight. That's the 400,600. That leaves us for the spring with, according to my calculations, $524,677. And again, we'll be coming into the fiscal year 2022 with a lot of additional money coming in, given our debt decreasing and some of the rollover money that's going in. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, I'd like to once again reiterate how much of a pleasure it is for me to work with all of you. 2020, I think, has been a really trying year for all of us, or I imagine it has, and to be surrounded by good folk doing good work, funding good projects is very meaningful for me and helpful uh, to have a, a productive committee that, that, does, that does good work. Um, Dan and Alan, just to reiterate, uh, in case you're a little confused about this, we are a recommending body. We do not fund anything. It's a city council that funds things. So what we're doing tonight in reviewing these five projects is the uh, recommendations, the uh, council orders that go to city council two weeks from tomorrow night. Is that right? On the... Uh, on the 19th, I believe, I'm sorry, on the 17th, uh, city council has a right to not approve what we recommend. They do not have the right to ever approve what we did not recommend. So if we don't recommend a project, they can't revisit that. Uh, they can only approve the projects or not approve the projects that we have put forward. And I think it's happened once in my memory that they did not approve a project. And that was going back to a previous mayor, and I can't quite remember that. Sarah, is that is that true? Just maybe one. Yes, that was before my time, also. But I think that was something that the city <coughs> said, at that point had some yeah. concerns. So. There were some some legal legal issues. So what we're going to do tonight, and uh, this should be fairly quick, these is to approve the five council orders that are going forth. Hopefully folks got those uh, that Sarah sent out yesterday. Thank you for getting those out a day before. Um, so I think we need, do we need motions on this, Sarah? Motions for each one? Uh, we could We could do one motion at the end if people are okay with that. Is, are, people, are people okay with one motion to approve? Oh, and we can have some discussion. Yes, thumbs up. Okay. Yes. So is there a motion to approve the five council orders that are in front of us? I think Martha of Mouth. So moved. <laughs> so, is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion on any of these? Linda. Uh, I, I had a couple of small comments on a number of them. The first one is the um, conservation fund. And yes. I wondered whether in the whereas clauses you wanted to mention that <clears throat> you provide an additional entrance to the Greenway. Is, do you think that's of any importance or not? Wasn't a big point, but that was raised that it, it provides something off of. Well, for the 
Uh, the the Pine Brook. I'm sorry. sorry. Did I say the wrong thing? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure. We could add that. And then I think the you shorted the amount by two hundred dollars. The last paragraph. I think it should be seventy three thousand four hundred. Yes. Okay. I'll double check those. One of the, I uh, was looking at the wrong spreadsheet when I did it. So one of them is 166. Yeah, one, you got 73, two and 87, two, and that doesn't quite get there. Good yep. catch. Good catch. Thank Lizzie. you. Thank you. Uh, my other similar little catch is um, the Academy. Academy. Yeah. 55 and 50. That's yeah, exactly. After now, therefore, be it ordered that it should say 55,000. Yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah. Excellent. Um, the next one, the Smith Charities. I, I wondered whether, and, and this is my thing about the creating a, a record about the, the anti a amendment. I wondered about adding another whereas clause that in some, in some way says that it's, the funds are being used exclusively for the exterior, the critical exterior um, repairs and in no way to support the operation of the charity itself. I would agree with that. Mission of it. It's to somehow just make it really clear that we're investing in this historic preservation and that that's not going to alleviate any of the operating burden on the, the mission of the charity. Sarah, is there a sentence that you have written there on that? Would have been nice if I'd come up with one, but I didn't. I think you did. You came up with something that's actually quite succinct. Sarah, can you read that? Uh, so whereas CPA funds will be utilized exclusively for critical exterior repairs and in no way contribute to the operating expenses of Smith Charity. Linda, that's good? Yeah. Great. And my last one was on. Um, if you're, if you're done with that, Sarah, I'll yep. wait. I'll start with that one. Um, was on the affordable housing fund. Um, okay. I, I stopped in the second whereas clause because it seems to imply that it can only be used to the extent that the city's successful, that it's actually creating these new affordable housing opportunities. And part of the point of due diligence is to find out whether you can move forward with something or not. And I don't want to box in the uses of these funds unnecessarily. So if it That's could, sort of the, the work with this fund, because if it doesn't result in the creation of new affordable housing it technically is not eligible for cpa funding oh um oh, so i i think the the planning department is only planning to expend these where they know that okay and and use okay. other okay. funds as needed for how does the planning department Super know that it's going to be funded before using the money for due diligence to look at the project. Uh, the, do you mean the ultimate project resulting from the due diligence? Right. Like, are they certain that, I mean, it, to some extent that will depend on other agencies, um, like Habitat for Humanity it will be a partner, probably Valley CDC and others, but I, I generally this would help to fulfill those agencies' missions as well. Um, but I think there's but so you many never of them know out you're there. going to get funded. If the, if the due diligence is done, the 
they would be happy to jump on it. Uh, Alan, a follow up on that? Well, maybe I'm missing something, but this is for expenditure of preliminary money to decide if a project is feasible or worthwhile or fundable or whatever. And you never know what the result of it will be until the money is spent. So I, I, maybe, I, Linda, were you suggesting that it not be spent unless they know the ultimate no, result? That's, that's impossible, but I, I, because you're right, you don't know until you get that final uh, award sure. of, of funds. Yeah. I think what Sarah is suggesting is that there are um, sites that the city knows is to some extent suitable for the housing, but it will be the particular design. How do they put out the RFP or whatever? How many units can fit on the site? That sort of stuff. So it will be a suitable site to some extent. And maybe the question is the extent or something like that. But Sarah, yeah, I'm, at, at least with the, the parcels that the planning office has in mind for this initial 50,000, um, they're relatively certain that those will be able to be developed. So it's not being used for you know, very preliminary due diligence for other sites. It's for these sites that are specifically intended for affordable housing, which just have these funding gaps that don't really allow it to move forward um, without this fund. Is that helpful for you, okay. Linda? Oh well, yeah, yep, yep, I'm, I'm set. I think it's fine as it is. Alan, that's, you're set with that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, if it were, a, you know, if, it, if an applicant came in with an absolute pre-development, uh, you know, we want to do basic due diligence, we don't even have any sites in mind, that would raise questions about CPA eligibility. But the way that this one was framed it, with these sites in mind, it really didn't. You faded out there. Could you repeat the last sentence? Um, so the, the way that this particular application was framed, it didn't really raise those questions about CPA eligibility. Okay. Can we um can we keep Alan's um, concern in mind when we readdress this issue because they're going to look for a refill for this at some point and see if there's and see if if we find ourselves in a situation where the uh, the planning department doesn't have in mind a set of specific um, projects where they they've already sort of you know gotten far enough down the road where they know it's going to move forward and 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 we can and we can carve some language in the next proposal where we can sort of address what Alan's what Alan's getting at. Sure, absolutely. And if the city didn't already own these properties and a real property interest was being acquired, the committee could absolutely require that if any CPA funds were expended that an affordable housing restriction be placed on the property, even if there wasn't a building being created. So that would be one way to look at it, but we definitely should keep that in mind. Would, would that help, I, Alan? I think so, yeah, for me. All right. Great, thank you, Chris. Linda, other comments? You do yeah, such a good it. job in, in, uh, in your due diligence. Other folks have comments on any of these? Um, I have a couple. Uh, I think one is just a question um, on the um, Fitzgerald Lake property. Um, in my understanding, is it not the Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake Greenway? Isn't that the name of it? Did I write? Did I write it says Beaverbrook here. That's wrong. Yes. I, okay. I, there is a Beaverbrook Greenway. This is not it, though. Thank okay. you. Okay. That was, yeah. Um, okay. And then the on the Academy, um, I, I think this is really a rehabilitation project. I don't think we should call this restoration because restoration would be basically restoring back to what was there originally and that's not what they're doing. So I would yeah, just- Yeah, I, I had questions about that when I was writing it, but I was referring to the Academy's application and was reluctant to change it without some input. Yeah, I, I think we should change it. Um, so that would be the that would be the first whereas is that correct? Second. Um, it's in both. 
and it's in the uh, oh, now therefore right. they ordered it as well. Yep. So it appears three times. It looks yep. like. Yep. yep. Sarah, uh, rehabilitation is not a dirty word, correct? No, no. It it has a different um, way that it's regarded in the secretary standards, but that's completely allowable as well. Great. So you catching it the three times? Yep, I got all three. Excellent. That's all that I have. <clears throat> Thank you, Martha. Other comments? Uh, I have a very nitpicky one, which is the um, Conservation Commission fund under the second whereas. Uh, it should re end with the placement of permanent conservation restrictions, I think, just an S on the end of restriction to make it restrictions. Okay. That is it. Any other comments on these before we vote? Okay, so we have five of these recommendations uh, going forth to the tune of $400,600 for these five projects. Sarah, are you ready to take us through a roll call? All set. Um, Brian? Yes. Chris? Yes. Linda? Yes. Jack? Not here. Jack is here. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry, I thought you said Jeff. Where's Jack? Jack. Yes, Jack. I think he's muted. His mouth moving, but I can't hear him. <laughs> I can read his lips. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a thumbs, um, up, Jack. Th there thumbs up. Thumbs right. okay. up. Uh, Martha. Yes. Dan. Yes. Julia. Yes. All right. All right. Him? Good to go. No, I think we got everybody right. No, I missed Alan. Alan? I wrote Dan first. Okay. All right. Unanimous. Thank you. Yes. All right. So moving right along to a funding round debriefing. Again, for Dan and Alan's uh, info, we try to end every um, fund, every round with just a little bit of uh, process evaluation, anything we need to tweak, things that we uh, would like to change perhaps for our deliberations next round. So uh, in terms of debriefing, any comments on the process, any things we should be doing differently moving forward that people have? Chris? Um, thanks. Uh, first, I wanna uh, thank you, Brian, for your, your steady leadership yet again. Um, it, it's always a pleasure getting together to work with everybody here, but uh, um, I think it runs really smoothly with, with, with you do, doing things for us. So I appreciate that. And also Sarah, of course, for just the monumental amount of work that you do on our behalf. Um, I just want to say to Alan and Dan, um, this was a really easy round for us. And uh, so you didn't get the, the true flavor of the sort of anguish we sometimes experience when we're confronted with the problem of having too many projects wanting too much money and too too few resources. Um, the shopping cart method worked really well for us this time because we didn't have to make any choices, but um, you were spared the moment where we have to do the real rating <coughs> between individual products, projects and, and, and um, um, you know, make some cuts in, in situations where um, good projects are in competition with other good projects. Um, and uh, I, I wish every round were this this easy um in that regard um and finally I I to, uh, yeah yeah and finally i want to say and i and i wish i i wish i had come to this sooner but uh, I, it raises the question you know because we had extra cash lying around it seemed <laughs> to me that this would have been an opportunity had 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 i thought of this sooner where we could have said something along the lines of you know we're creating this um uh this this um this fund for uh, investment in 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 housing and the request was fifty thousand. Um, I don't know why I didn't think to submit the possibility that we up that number. I know that when projects come to us with a set budget for whatever, 
um, we, you know, we struggled to make sure that that, that that budget makes sense. But this was creation of a fund um, that didn't have a specific allocation in mind, but only a specific purpose. And um, I feel that I feel that we may have missed an opportunity to put aside more money um, <clears throat> for a rainy day. Uh, and, and and I regret that I didn't think of it sooner. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and welcome, Jeff. Uh, we knew that you were going to be late, caught up in another meeting. Um, and Jeff, we have gone through already <coughs> approving the five council orders and have moved now to doing a little debriefing on our last round. So if you have any comments in terms of changes to be made, uh, now is the time. It's probably already been said by other people, but um, for the people who are new to the committee, um, this is not the normal way we function. Mm -hmm. We're usually overwhelmed with proposals and we don't have enough money to do some of them justice and we have to make a lot of tough decisions and it's strung out and it it takes a lot of time so i'm surely other people have already said that before that was that was my main takeaway um from this round is this is the, the first one of these sessions that i've been in where we actually had um a lot of money to work with um and I did hear what Chris just mentioned, and I also, I, I think that's a good thought too. Is that we, you know, I didn't think of that either, and I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Sarah, have we ever funded a project beyond what the request was? No. And that does not put us in conflict with any, anything that we need to be aware of. No. Nope. Julia. Um, so I would, you know, my reflection every time we go through this is that it just doesn't happen without some really great leadership. And so my first reflection, Brian, is a really great deal of thanks to you for the way you lead us as we work through this process and the way you organize us and keep us on task with, um, with a sense of humor. So I appreciate that. And Sarah, for keeping track of everything that's going on, uh, I know it can be hard to put your documents out there and then have everybody go, oh, you missed the five and the comma and the semicolon, uh, but we really appreciate the work that you're doing for us. Chris, I heard what you said about that. And in fact, in that moment when we were funding it, I did for a moment think, oh, we could actually put more into this. We could do more. And, and I'm not sure that, that that's necessarily the right decision because we have now, we are now walking into a second funding cycle flush in comparison to past years. And so that means that if there was a project as opposed to a fund, uh, we have the money now for a project, for a housing project that could come in the spring. And I've got my hopes up that that's what's going to happen, that we're going to actually uh, be able to, 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 to put some funding into, into you know, bricks and mortar projects potentially. Uh, in, in housing and into other projects that matter. I'm, I'm excited that we got to fund everything in this round. It made it an easy round, everybody said that. And I'm also very excited to walk into the spring knowing that it's not $25,000 that we're about to uh, try to figure out how to split apart, but yeah. that we actually have, have something, something sitting in our, in our account. Uh, Sarah, I know we've asked this before, but do you know of any projects coming down the pike for our next round? Uh, Lily Library potentially has something small. Um, the rec department might be looking at um, some new recreational opportunities, and that's all I'm aware of at this point. <clears throat> Nothing in terms of rental assistance that I, I anticipate that there will be some, but I, I don't know who may be submitting that or what it will look like yet. And I don't believe those applicants do either. Oh, and the Historical Commission is also planning to come back with a historic preservation plan application. Great, other comments that folks have? Thank you for the kind words. And I think we're ready to move on then to the 2021 schedule. Uh, Sarah? So 
Well, I just sent that out today. Um, I realized it was on the agenda and I, I hadn't put it together yet. So I, I did that quickly, but that's, it's essentially based on um, last spring's schedule, although that was drastically reduced because there really wasn't any funding available at that point. Um, did folks receive this as an email? I, I did not. I guess I was late in looking at it. Yes. Is there, is there anything we need to discuss about it or is this just for our setting up our Wednesday evenings, first and third Wednesdays? Oh, here we go. <clears throat> so we have meetings on the 17th, the 3rd of March, the 17th of March as well. And anything else there? April 7th and then the 21st as needed. So really our first thing that we we'll need to be looking at is um, uh, getting questions in on the on uh, well the first will be the first meeting on the 17th and then questions in on February the 19th and then site visits perhaps as well. Questions about what what Sarah's putting up? One addition I didn't put it on the schedule here, uh, but in January we could have a public hearing on the updated community preservation plan, which I need to work on. <clears throat> Great, good. Any other questions about this, comments? Eva, I know you've explained this to me before, but I always get confused by it, Sarah. Why, since it's really our second funding round in our allocation year, why is it called funding round one? Uh, because it's the... I, we were we didn't want to change it because it's sort of the way it, it always was done, but it, this is done on calendar year instead of fiscal year, although our funding is on a fiscal year basis. But we're not we're not stuck with this. We could change the name if we wanted to. Let's make it seasonal. Fall funding, spring funding. Mm. Mm -hmm. hey. Any other comments about the uh Funding round one for 2021. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for putting this up. And we'll be meeting again in, what, what is that, two months? Two and a half months? Um, exactly. Yes, yeah, so that's the, the first regular meeting. I will be in touch with you before then about the Community Preservation Plan. About what, Sarah? Uh, uh, the, so, Alan, we, we have a Community Preservation Plan uh, that guides the the decisions of the committee. And it's really based on other comprehensive plans like the housing production plan and um, open space plan. So it is just sort of distills all of those bigger documents into something for applicants and the community preservation committee to look at. And it also outlines the administrative procedure. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, moving on, Sarah, you're back on with a, as we had asked, uh, a few months ago, I believe, to get a little tutorial on conservation restrictions. Um, so we know whenever we fund acquisition of a property, we are also uh, putting a conservation restriction on that property and often funding the costs to go with that conservation restriction. And as I think folks know, it's, it's something that's not held by the city, but held by a, uh, another organization. And Sarah will take us through that. So thank you, Sarah, for putting this together. So, my... Oh, it's working. Usually it, it boots me off of Zoom, but it doesn't seem to be doing that. So that, that's exciting. Maury. So I lose, I lose my Zoom if I uh, if I go to full screen. So can everybody see this? Okay, and you have it in PDF. Also. Um, 
so earlier in the year, Wayne provided an introduction to agricultural preservation restrictions as part of his presentation on the recent Omasta acquisition, which was sort of a, a split between an APR and a conservation property. And as a complement to that, this is an overview of conservation restrictions as they relate to CPA acquisitions primarily. Um, so to demonstrate the different, um, how different conservation restriction and conservation properties could be. The photo on the left is Sheldon Field, which is a more active recreation area. And on the right is the riverfront portion of the Bean Allard Farm. So both of these have CRs, are, but are very, very different. Um, so property rights are seen as a bundle of sticks. And here's an illustration of the, the bundle of sticks. Ownership can be fee simple, which is the entire bundle of all of the sticks or less than fee where the owner retains the overall ownership of the property, but some of the sticks are owned by somebody else. So this can prohibit some types of activities or assert, assign certain rights to others. So essentially in a conservation restriction scenario, development rights are no longer available. And in Massachusetts, restrictions have to be approved and signed onto by the appropriate state agency. So that's the Department of Agricultural Resources for agricultural preservation restrictions, mass historic for historic preservation restrictions, and for CRs, it's the Division of Conservation Services of the Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And these are permanent documents that, re that are recorded at the Registry of Deeds that are also signed onto by all parties. So the holder, uh, in, in our case, the City Council and the Conservation Commission. What is a CR exactly? Um, the owner, either the city or in the case of a privately held CR, an individual retains the title, um, but not all of the sticks. They're giving some of their, their bundle of sticks away. All conservation restrictions prevent development, but can be customized to allow or not allow other types of uses, as long as they're consistent with the conservation values of the property. They can also either create public access or not, which comes up more often with privately held CRs because a lot of uh, landowners are interested in having their property pretty permanently protected, but don't necessarily want to allow public access. Um, and for privately retained CRs also, where a municipality or another organization like the land trust is holding the restriction, there are tax benefits provided by the loss of the development value, as well as potential reductions in assessment value going forward. Since assessment is based on the highest and best use of a property, this is generally reduced if the development is no longer is an option. And Massachusetts also has special tax incentive programs just for land protection. Uh, so although the city holds many CRs on privately owned land, I'm focusing uh, the presentation tonight mostly on restrictions that are placed on permanently protected open space that is owned by the city, since that's where it's CPRs and CPA and conservation restrictions most often meet. When an open space parcel is purchased by the city, it's under the care and custody of the Conservation Commission which is specifically allowed by statute to hold real property interests. And that in itself provides a, a level of protection since one of the charges of the commission is resource protection. Um, the Conservation Commission wouldn't allow um, anything to take place on their property, which would harm the, the conservation values anyway. At least that's the case happily with conservation commissions now, but you know, who knows what would happen in the future. Um, and additionally, all municipally owned open spaces are subject to Article 97 of the state constitution, which requires a two thirds vote of the state legislature for a conversion to another use, as well as typically other land to be protected in exchange, although that, that isn't specifically required. And it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Municipalities can seek to convert open space to a school, a police station, or some other type of use. And the, the state legislature has allowed that in some cases in the past. But the CPA legislation has an additional level of protection to ensure that CPA funds that are spent on real property interests, and that applies to all el eligible categories, not just open space, also housing, recreation, and historic preservation. So they, that limit future uses to the purposes for which it was acquired. Um, this is where Mr. Belt and Suspenders comes in, because this requires a, a CR for every open space purchase, thereby doubling it, doubling protection in case our open space pants are going to fall down sometime in the future after we're, uh, we and all of our good intentions are gone. Sarah, before we move on. Sure. Um, on the conversion, um, you talked about conversion for municipalities. What about um, land that's um, held in the CR uh, that's privately held? What if they are 
we're interested in getting a conversion. So uh, if that would, if the, there is a CR in place, that would also trigger a, an Article 97 issue because the uh, the state has signed on to the conservation district. So so I as a I as a landowner, if I wanted to convert the use of my land from CR to something else, I would it would require a, a two thirds vote of the state legislature for me specifically. It would. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Yes. Has uh, Northampton ever had a uh, conversion where land has been taken out of conservation restriction and assigned some other value? Uh, the, the only times that we've had that happen are, um, are trades for land. There was a situation off of, um, I think it was Audubon Road, where a conservation restriction for a future trail location was uh, put in place, but then it, it just really didn't make sense once the development happened years later that the, the restriction should be in that particular location. So we, we ended up trading for a much larger parcel of land in a situation that made more sense for everybody. But we've never had a conversion to another use, like a, um, like a, a school or a fire station or something like that. Thank you. Uh, so, so what are CRs again? Uh, what's the restriction document that creates this per permanent protection? So it outlines conservation values, which are different and unique for every property. Um, they include reference to a baseline documentation report, which is a detailed report on the conditions of the property at the time it was acquired. So that, you know, 100 years from now, people can look back and see what the, the area looked like. Um, they also provide provisions for monitoring and enforcement, including possible legal action if necessary, and include surveys of the boundaries. Um, we didn't used to do surveys for conservation properties, but that's typical and is always done now. Um, and they often, but not always, carry an associated stewardship cost due, due to these commitments required of the conservation restriction holders. And th these are just some examples of conservation values that help to frame the purpose of each restriction and the types of activities that may or may not be permitted on a given property. Wildlife habitat is a typical one, as well as ground and surface water protection. This is a photo of the vernal pool, which could represent both of these values. Public access and recreation is something else that's typical. Uh, climate change resilience is becoming increasingly more important. And this can include things like carbon sequestration of forested areas, as well as natural flood storage to retain stormwater high in natural areas and watersheds and prevent damage to potentially overloaded underground stormwater systems in urban er areas that are lower in watersheds. Uh, Wayne included, uh, he didn't specifically call it a conservation value, but he, when he was presenting the um, Pinebrook Connector Project, he did mention that uh, this would provide some natural flood storage as an example of that. Um, protection of scenic view sheds and historic landscapes also come up frequently. Um, in our area, this can include views of the Holyoke Range, for example, or protection of hillsides from development and protection of stone walls or Native American features. And each restriction can be modified to better fit the property uh, for whose conservation values it's intended to protect. Generally, an activity or use is prohibited unless it's specifically identified as an exception. Structures, for example, are typically prohibited, but some types can be allowed. Um, certain types of farm buildings under a certain size, for example, if there is some agriculture occurring on the property are often allowed, as are trail structures and wildlife blinds. Um, Broadbrook Coalition and Leeds Civics Wildlife Blind at the Beaverbrook Broadbrook property is a good example of that. Uh, Kestrel Land Trust holds a restriction on, on that property, but that was something that was allowed. Um, it actually make, made us think a little differently about it because we didn't specifically call it out as something that, that should be allowed, but everyone agreed that was consistent with the conservation values. So we include that language uh, as a matter of course going forward. Small scale green burial where appropriate, as well as burial rights for past owners if desired are sometimes built in, as well as multi-use use paths if the city is planning for them in a certain area. Um, an example of this is the one just built at Perth's Bog. This was uh, always intended for that property, so it was uh, included as an exception in the restriction. Plan forestry in accordance with stewardship plans that are intended for long-term forest health are allowed, as well as vista pruning, but clear cutting is never allowed. Um, and it's really important to identify these uses and the types of approval by the CR holder, if any, at the onset, 
when the document is created and make it very clear. And you know, everyone who's involved in it now might might know uh, what's intended and what's important. But these are forever restrictions with the long term in mind. Um, and they're often silent about things that could change in the future, such as hunting, um, that that don't necessarily have direct ties to conservation values because we don't want to tie future hands unnecessarily. And um, our, our most frequent partners in holding restrictions on CPA properties, uh, Lead Civic, who felt so strongly about holding restrictions, updated their mission statement to make it very clear to the state that conservation is part of their core, core value, is a value partner both for active management of conservation areas and leads, as well as a CR holder. Um, Mass Audubon, um, mostly in the Rocky Hill Greenway closest to Arcadia, is where the property is consistent with uh, Mass Audubon's mission. It's a, also a frequent CR holder. Um, and they, they don't charge for conservation restriction holding. And in exchange, we often uh, hold restrictions on Mass Audubon properties as well. And Kestrel Land Trust uh, is a little more versatile. Um, they, they do charge for um, restriction holding. Uh, but but they're more willing to hold lands all over the city. So that's that's an overview. I didn't go into anything specifically or any um, specific conservation uh, restrictions on CPA properties, but feel free to fire away any questions you've got. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, questions for Sarah? Uh, I have one. When when Kestrel when we pay Kestrel money for the conservation restriction, what uh, what do they do? I mean, what wh why do we pay them money and what do they do with it? So Kestrel is uh, like Mass Audubon is an accredited land trust, and they have certain requirements um, for endowments going forward because the just in case they have to take legal action in the future, they want to have a, a pot of money to make sure that they can do that effectively. And they, they also do really great annual monitoring. They give us good reports of what's going on, not only on our properties and issues that they might have, the things that the city is doing, but also what abutters are up to and if we need to do any follow-up there. Um, and, and they're also just a, a great partner to help us try and protect additional lands moving forward. And is that an annual fee or is that a one-time thing? It, it depends on how it's structured. Um, currently, we have an agreement with them where um, we're set up to, I, I believe it's 500 acres that are protected. But in the past, it's been um, per acquisition. Julie? So Sarah, oh, sorry. Were you, I'm sorry, Brian, were you done? Uh, I, I was calling on Julia with her hand up. I, I was just curious in follow-up. How, how is the partner selected? And do we as a committee have any role in saying, well, would you consider this partner? I mean, you know, we have, we have conservation restrictions that with CPA money that have that involve three different partners. And I remember projects with all three partners. So how does that happen? Uh, the, the committee to date has never been involved at that level. They've always left it up to the applicant to figure out how to make uh, each acquisition work and, and each one is different. So if there's a property that's being acquired like Pine Grove and the Rocky Hill Greenway and Mass Audubon is the most logical partner there because that's, that's really part of their core area. And they're also interested in working with the city going forward on management, then they're the most logical selection. Um, if it's something in Roberts Hill uh, that's critical to lead Civic Association's mission, then, then generally they're, um, they're the ones who come to the forefront. Um, Kestrel is a little bit more flexible, but they are definitely more expensive. Chris? Yeah, this is a more basic question. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the, the, the underlying um, constraint is state law, but, but why are we required to enter into, enter into these partnership arrangements? Why is the city not allowed to hold the conservation restriction outright on its own? Uh, so we're not allowed to, and, and no property owner would, would be able to hold both the restriction on a property and the underlying fee interest. Um, so there have been cases where the city held a conservation restriction on a privately owned parcel, and then that 
um, that parcel was later acquired in fee by the city. And at that point, the restriction is extinguished. So the, the interests are merged. We, we can't hold both. Right, but I'm not, I'm not sure why we can't. I, I know we can't, I'm just not sure what the logic behind that is. So we, if in the future, some city council decided like, hey, you know what, Roberts Hill is a really great location for a police station. We need to put a, a new police station at Roberts Hill. If the city held the restriction on the property, we wouldn't be able to take enforcement against ourselves. Oh, so it serves as a check on that kind of behavior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, I got it. All right, thank you. Other questions for Sarah? We hold, uh, is it just those three leads, uh, Civic, Kestrel, and Audubon, or are there other players as well? Uh, Broadbrook Coalition had formerly held uh, conservation restrictions, uh, but they decided later that, that that wasn't really something that they were equipped to do, and they they passed those along to uh, lead civic for the most part. Uh, and also I didn't meant, oh, I, I should have mentioned M3C Meadow City Conservation Coalition. Uh, they're also our, our partner in the Meadow. So they hold the conservation restriction on Sheldon Field, um, Montview and a, a couple others in the Connecticut River Greenway. Thank you. Any other comments for Sarah? <clears throat> Great, that was very helpful, Sarah. Thank you for guiding us through that. Exactly. And uh, we appreciate that. Great. Uh, moving right along, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? No, well, we are good to go. Another successful round. Everybody pat themselves on the back. Uh, and we will see you February, what do we say, 17th? Is that right? And be in contact Correct. with Sarah before yep. that. I will right. do that. So everyone have a wonderful, healthy, safe rest of your 2020. And we'll look forward to a new year. So uh, <laughs> Julie, Julie is looking good there. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.